In previous parts of this talk discussing the current economic crisis in Pakistan, we have argued that economic theory itself is a source of the problem. It blinds us to the reality of the problem and makes, it una makes us unable to find solutions. So to learn what modern economics is and why it is the way it is, we must go back to its roots which uh, lie in the enlightenment of Europe. More than a century of deadly religious wars in Europe led to the search for ways to organize society which would uh, make room for tolerance. And basically the enlightenment is the name of the intellectual movement from many different diverse uh, sources which attempted to find the basis for creating a tolerant society in Europe. And uh, this new method of thinking about society and how to organize it is uh, the outcome of Enlightenment thinking. Uh, so all of social sciences is a product of the Enlightenment and economics, the queen of the social sciences, is particularly a product of Enlightenment. There was a huge variety of different approaches taken by Enlightenment thinkers on how we can build a tolerant societies. Many of them uh, developed approaches going through religion, uh, reinterpreting religion or uh, uh, Bible criticism led to the possibility of different understandings of the Bible. Uh, there was the approach through natural religion which uh, said that Religion is directly part of our nature and so uh, everyone participates in this religion. So hmm, one of the significant uh, approaches was that of Kant who sought to make reason as the primary source of knowledge and all other human knowledges like religion would be built on reason. So this had the potential to unite all knowledge on uh, foundations of reason and therefore uh, allow for a uni united approach uh, which would uh, reject, which would allow for freedom of uh, human beings.
So instead of going over the confusing and complex history of the Enlightenment and subsequent developments, we jump to the conclusions which emerged in the form of secular modernity. And these are grouped around, the conclusions are grouped around the answers to four questions. Uh, what are the principles of knowledge? What is knowledge? Epistemology. What is a good society? And what are the collective goals that are worth striving for? And what are the standards of behavior for us individually, collectively, in communities, in families, etc.? So one of the keys to modernity is to understand that we must provide the answers to this question without any theological basis, without using the Quran, religion, without using the Bible or tradition or authority. So considering the four questions uh, in sequence, the fundamental and most important one is about epistemology or the theory of knowledge. Because the West rejected the Bible as a source of knowledge for the very good reason that it had led to centuries of war, um, they were forced to reconstruct knowledge from scratch because everybody had believed in the Bible for centuries. And so this had been discredited. So all tradition, all inherited knowledge came under uh, suspicion. And so uh, the Enlightenment thinkers sought to rebuild knowledge starting from zero, as exemplified by Descartes, who says, I think, therefore I am. Uh, he's starting the argument from having no knowledge at all to coming to be aware of his own existence. This is sort of the first building block of knowledge. So uh, one of the fundamental um, principles adopted by Enlightenment thinkers was to say that all knowledge comes from observations and reason. And there's no built-in knowledge. There's no uh, a priori knowledge because the a priori assumptions of religion had led uh, Europeans astray and had led them to battles. So it was necessary to deny uh, the existence of a priori knowledge. So there was a radical redefinition of what a good society is from traditional views to modern views. A traditional view was that society is like one body which works together for achievement of common goals, even though different parts have different values. So the head and the feet and the arms, they are all part of a common body striving together for common goals. But the society itself may have a lot of inequality. Uh, secular modernity came to entirely different conclusion, which basically flattened and equalized society. All members are supposed to be equal, but they don't have common goals. Everyone has their own religion. And so the goal of society is no longer to work together for achievement of common goals. It's just to allow different with, people with different goals to live together in peace. And so one of the outcomes of this was the individualism, everyone is free to pursue whatever goal they want. And the other outcome was the social contract, that the people come together to make a collection of rules by which they can live together in peace, and they all agree to follow these rules. Uh, that's called the rule of law. Even though these laws themselves, the rules themselves, don't have any particular sacred authority behind them. These are just a collection of rules that we all agree to. Uh, so society comes into being by consensus. So one very important consequence of this um, idea that the society doesn't have any collective goal because every member has their own different private goals is that uh, there was only room for collective action on the basis of two intermediate goals, which are freedom and wealth. So the collective goal of society is only to provide freedom. Freedom itself is not a goal. Freedom is the freedom to do something. Freedom is valuable if it allows you to do what you want to do and not valuable if, for example, if I have the freedom to go to Mars, but I don't want to go to Mars, then this freedom is not very useful to me. So freedom, but this intermediate goal became a final goal as uh, as the only possibility for the collective goal of a society. 
And similarly, wealth is the means to freedom, means to realize if I want to do something but I don't have the material means to do it, then that freedom is not very useful. So the pursuit of wealth, which is condemned in Christianity, became uh, acceptable and eventually desirable. And uh, so uh, these values of secular society, freedom, everyone is free to do what they want and say, including freedom of speech, uh, these became uh, central to secular society because these were the only things which secular society could agree on. So even though these goals are not valuable in themselves, it arouses surprise to say that um, even though I hate what you're going to say, I will defend to death your right to say it. Why should you do something like that? Well, that's because the European Enlightenment thinkers had seen the consequences of not doing so, which was bloody warfare for centuries. So they said that we must learn to tolerate dissent. Finally, in terms of rules of behavior, morality could no longer be taken from Christian sources. So it was replaced by rationality. What it is reasonable, so rational behavior became moral behavior. And uh, the implications of this were very startling because uh, once you say that knowledge is confined to what you can see and reason about, then God, afterlife, day of judgment, angels, etc., all of this becomes uh, not part of knowledge and it becomes irrational to believe in that because uh, you are going beyond the sources of knowledge. So once you reject afterlife, then um, utilitarianism naturally emerges that what gives us pleasure is uh, good and uh, moral and what gives us pain is evil and irrational. Uh, good can no longer be defined from uh, scripture, so good is just defined by consensus. What we all agree to is good, and then this can be enforced by the state. And this was pretty explicit in the thinking of Europeans that morality is actually a creation of the state. And uh, this had the dramatic implication that state themselves are not bound by morality because they create these rules and they can change these rules. And so uh, it has been argued coherently by Zygmunt Bowman that the Holocaust, which was the extermination of the Jews project by very deadly means, was a simple a consequence of modernity, not an aberration. So we come to the second portion of the talk where we take all of these fundamental ideas of uh, secular modernity and subject them to an Islamic critique. So we come to the idea that all knowledge is based on observations and logic. Uh, the, uh, our in Kalam tradition considers this position, asks where does this knowledge come from? Which observation or what logical reasoning? And actually this position is itself self-contradictory because this is a piece of knowledge which does not come from observations and logic. And uh, so this, despite the obvious self-contradiction, this has been the dominant position and continues to dominate European intellectual tradition. Why this uh, insistence on something which is a simple, a simple mistake? And this comes from basically the rejection of religion and uh, intellectual traditions which had led to wars. And so the necessity of rebuilding knowledge from scratch and the necessity of building consensus across the different uh, warring Christian factions, this led to the insistence that we must build knowledge on neutral foundations. We cannot uh, use any metaphysics. We cannot go outside what can be seen and uh, agreed to by common consensus by everyone. So that's why reason and observations are supposed to be of uh, universal acceptability. But this, the fact that this cannot be done uh, was never admitted and agreed to, even though the fact is that it is impossible to build knowledge on the basis of purely observations and logic. One must go outside and one must add some 
principles which come from our hearts and our prior knowledge of what the universe is like which has been built into us uh, when God taught us the names of things. Imam al-Ghazali starts from the same place that is uh, starts from the position that suppose I know nothing and I want to acquire knowledge how should I do it uh, but he comes to conclusions which are very different from those that Western intellectuals came to starting from the same position and there is a lots of evidence that Western intellectuals actually looked at Imam al-Ghazali's book uh, but they were unable to follow some of the key conclusions that he uh, arrives at. So when Imam al-Ghazali said that I will confine myself to my own observations and logic he came up with the realization that our observations can be faulty do not lead to certain log uh, certain certainty and similarly logic can be faulty and so if we start from zero we remain at zero there is no way to make progress and this led him to despair until Allah Ta'ala cast a noor in his heart which restored his confidence in his uh, use of his uh, senses and logic. So basically it is the heart and the intuition which allows us to have confidence that we are thinking reasonably and that our senses are sound and reveal what the world around us looks like. So uh, one of the major blunders made by the Western um, intellectuals in the secular modernity was the rejection of heart as the source of knowledge. It's very understandable why they made this blunder because the heart testifies to the existence of God and this is one thing they wanted to deny but in rejecting the heart they fall under this uh, admonition of the Quran that it is not the eyes which are blind but the hearts within the breasts which become blind. And so they accepted an, uh, a theory of knowledge which uh, um, excludes the heart and is therefore blind to central concerns of human beings. Because their intellectual tradition of Christianity had led them astray, the Western intellectuals made the more or less correct decision to reject tradition. But this leads us into a dilemma that the collective human knowledge is the labors of hundreds of thousands of scholars over the millennia. And so we can't rebuild this from scratch and uh, we don't. We accept most of the knowledge that I have and that you have comes from just reading books which have been read by, uh, which have been written by scholars and accepting most of the intellectual tradition that has come down to us, the received knowledge and making a little bit uh, questioning some small parts of it. So it is true that intellectual heritage can have errors and indeed Allah Ta'ala asks us in the Quran to question those things which, which are wrong. But this doesn't mean that we have to question everything. In fact, it is impossible to question everything. So instead of rejecting all tradition and starting to build from ground zero using reasons, observations, which is basically an impossible task, we have to accept the limitation that we will remain within the intellectual traditions that exist and search for how to judge between them, how to avoid errors and how to compare and evaluate. So this requires a set of tools for meta-analysis. We have different intellectual disciplines, different uh, streams of thought, different schools of thought and we have to learn how to evaluate between them. We have to develop tools for meta-analysis of these traditions if we want to make progress. So why do reasons and observation never lead us anywhere? Uh, that's because uh, reason is sterile. Reason is always reasoning from some premises to some conclusions. So it is the premises which contain the knowledge and not reason. Uh, reason only allows us to extract some things from the premises. So one of the standard uh, problems that occurred due to this was that the emphasis on reason led to ignoring the premise. So the famous example of Descartes, I think therefore I am, seems like we are using reasoning to come to a conclusion 
of my own existence, but this is not really what is happening. What is happening is that the premise, I think, includes automatically the subject I, and the existence of the subject I is already assumed in the premise. So it is the content of the premise, I think, which has been taken, and that content is replicated in the conclusion. <coughs> so <coughs> reason doesn't give us anything. It is the premise which gives us knowledge. Similarly, when we come to observations, uh, the ability to make observations requires a framework. When I say that I see a tree, this means that I already have a framework in my mind of what trees look like, and there's a category. This category exists in the mind. It doesn't exist in external reality. There's nothing we can point to in the real world, which is tree. Tree is a concept of our mind. Uh, so the ability to see a tree depends on the frameworks, and this is perhaps the meaning of the names that were taught to Adam. So the ability to make observations depends on these frameworks. So again, there's something which comes prior to observation, uh, an intellectual framework which allows us to coherently organize these observations. So basically, knowledge does not come from reasons and observations. It comes from uh, a lot of knowledge is built into us. It's, it's a priori. And ignoring this knowledge leads to dramatic distortions in our theory of knowledge. So lesson of this is simple, that Western intellectual product claims to be based on observations and logic. So when we look at the observations, we should look at the framework used to gather those observations. And generally, in social sciences, this framework is the framework of Western societies, the kind of institutional structures and uh, uh, all of the um, all of the ideas on which Western societies were based these these come in the background and uh, are not taken into explicit account. Similarly, reasoning in the West is also built on certain foundations which are hidden, and these premises are not exposited. So, these concealed concealed premises of reasoning and the concealed premises of the concealed uh, uh, frameworks for observations, these have to be brought out in order to understand what is really going on. So it's useful to contrast the Western conception of a good society where everyone is free to pursue their own goals, and this leads to individualism, and the collective goals of society are freedom uh, in political and economic and social domains, as opposed to this, the Islamic view is very much that communities are bound together by love. Pain in one part is felt by other. The collective goals of a society is to ensure that every member uh, gets to realize the infinite potential that lies within each human being. With the Quran values one human life as equal to the entire humanity. This is an indication of the infinite potential within each person. So the goal of a society is to provide a conducive environment to the development and growth of this potential. Pursuit of freedom and wealth has led to meaningless lives because people do not know how to use their freedom wisely uh, and people do not know how to use their wealth uh, to, in a way that would bring welfare. And uh, people today just pursue wealth without understanding why they are doing it. Uh, Max Weber put this in the way that um, he used the term iron cage, that there, there are certain ways of thinking that lead to accumulation of wealth without uh, using it for enjoyment. And these ways of belt, uh, thinking got built into society. So now people do this without realizing that what they are doing is meaningless and uh, there are lots of books on morality in the 20th century which show how uh, things have gone horribly wrong by this uh, idea of replacing morality by rationality. The two world wars were the deadliest in the uh, history of mankind, uh, but they have been sort of continuous warfare, genocides, destructions of entire nations for calculated power and profits. Uh, and basically, this comes from the fact that there is no basis for morality once the heart is excluded as a source of knowledge.
So we conclude with just a brief remark that even though the whole enlightenment started out as a search for tolerance and a lot of tolerant philosophies were developed and they are written into the um, constitutions and the charters of human rights in Western philosophies. But the reality on the ground has been very different. Even the development of these philosophies has not led to tolerance. So um, even though the constitution promises of, of the USA promises equal rights, uh, the famous Dred Scott decision decided that uh, Negroes or blacks were not uh, entitled to these rights because they were not human beings. And similarly, Kant's uh, moral philosophy says that all rational human beings are uh, worthy of respect. But uh, he also argued that people who are not white are not rational and therefore not worthy of respect. So even though these philosophies have the appearance of uh, tolerance and uh, respect for humans, uh, the interpretation and ground reality has been very different. With this, we come to the end of part five on the search for tolerance and the enlightenment. Offhand, it, uh, it doesn't seem to have any connection to current economic problems in Pakistan, but actually it's uh, very strongly related. These enlightenment philosophies were used to colonize the world and they were spread throughout the world by the Western education system. And these philosophies are uh, deadly to human welfare and they lead us to search for solutions in directions where none are to be found and to reject our own intellectual heritage which does contain the solutions to our modern problems.